Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Muy buenas tardes. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Roxana Reyes. I'm a licensed marriage family therapist, and I work at UC Davis in the Community Advising Network. And on behalf of CAN, welcome, and thank you for coming. Um, and to all the UC folks who put this together, thank you so much for the time to present on CAN. Um, we are celebrating our fifth anniversary this year. Was it this year? Yes. We 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 yeah. So we're five years old. <laughs> Very happy about that. Um, so before we get started, um, I think we'll just introduce ourselves. So um, I'm a community counselor at UC Davis, and I work in the, with the units Chicana Chicano Studies and Educational Opportunity Program. And hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Sheetal Shah, and I'm also a CAN counselor. I'm partnered with Services for International Students and Scholars in the Middle Eastern South Asia Studies Program. So today, we're hoping to pack a lot into our short time together. Um, we're going to give you a little bit of the history of CAN, why it was developed. Um, we're going to give you an overview of the program. We're going to talk a little bit about some of the strengths and the challenges we've faced um, on campus, give you some of the legal considerations um, if you're planning on implementing something like this on your college campuses, and we highly recommend it, um, things to consider. And we'll share a little bit of, of some of the perspectives from our units and things that they have said about CAN, um, and then uh, talk about uh, future directions for our program. So a little bit about the history. As many of you probably know, um, in 2006, UC Office of the President did a study on mental health services and found that across all of the UC campuses, um, basically the demographic of students who receive counseling services was very narrow. They were mainly white females. Um, and the data also showed that the service providers were of the same narrow demographic. Um, at the same time, we had um, a very motivated family who were unfortunately coping with the loss of their college son um, who they lost to suicide. So they were very proactive in, um, in lobbying and, and talking to UC Office of the President and asking for some change and some help in mental, providing mental health services. So as these two things came together, they both influenced um, the um, decision to provide all UC campuses mental health augmentation funds. Um, and I believe that was in 2006. Um, at UC Davis, an advisory board was created. Um, and because to address the demographic of students um, that were receiving services, we wanted, they wanted to create a program that was specifically designed to reach out to the marginalized populations. So um, the advisory board consisted of all of our folks on campus who were directing the student life centers, um, the ethnic studies departments. We had key people from student affairs. And everyone came in to talk about how we were going to address this issue on campus. Um, Basically, everyone agreed that we needed more um, counseling, non-advising uh, or non-academic counseling, but counseling and educational services reaching out to these student populations. So CAN was created, and in 2009, we hired our first, um, our first team of six multicultural psychotherapists. And like I said, we're celebrating our fifth anniversary um, this year, so we're very happy to be here presenting to you today. With that, let's go to the CAN model. Talking about the CAN model? Okay. Um, so as Roxana talked about, we, oops, hi. <laughs> as Roxana talked about, we really wanted to make sure that we were integrated on our campus. Um, and so what we did, so the, so the goal of CAN was to essentially decrease the barriers to ac and, and increase access to services. Um, so there's six of us that work for the program. So we're a team of six multicultural counselors. Um, we have various identities that intersect that we openly talk about with our students. And we are constantly addressing um, race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation. We're constantly thinking about how these identities impact um, the, our students individually and then the systems that they're a part of. Um, we hope that we're approachable and comfortable. Um, but we do that, and, and, and I laugh about it, but 
but I think that's an important part of the work that we do. We make sure that we go to community events. We make sure that we're constantly doing outreach. We make sure that we speak to our students on the quad. Um, we make sure that we're just visible, um, and we do everything we can to integrate ourselves into the community. So not only are we part of the two different partner units that we work for, we're part of it. We think about ourselves as part of a big campus community, um, and then also the community of mental health professionals that we that we work with. Um, so we tend to be pretty visible across the campus um, and are integrated into the communities. And an example of that is oftentimes I'll be walking on the quad and a student will come up to me and say, hey, Sheetal, can I make an appointment with you? That to me tells me that students are really excited to access services, but they're not carrying that shame or maybe that embarrassment about coming to mental health services. Um, somebody talked about kind of this idea that sometimes us CAN counselors were like these celebrities on campus. Um, <laughs> I don't really like that notoriety or that kind of visibility, but I do appreciate the fact that students are saying, wow, that's a mental health professional that's approachable and that's part of my community and I'm okay talking to her in front of other people. Um, I think that's a really wonderful sign. Um, and we're also really committed to building relationships. Can, wouldn't, can just wouldn't work if relationship building wasn't a part of it. So we go to, you know, we're part of different academic programs, we're part of different um, student affairs um, units, and we're part of different kind of service centers on our campus. We go to all of their staff meetings, so we're really integrated into their staff. We go to um, different kind of public forums that students might have, so town hall meetings or kind of weekly or biweekly or monthly meetings um, of different student organizations. We go to their meetings just to make sure that they know who we are, we participate, we do all the activities that they have, they're, they're doing themselves so we can integrate ourselves with them. Um, and we do what we can to make sure that the communities know that we are part of their communities. Um, so aside from offering the mental health and wellness advice or tips or services, we say, hey, we're part of you, we understand what you're going through and we want to work with you. That's the CAN model. And we'll explain um, kind of the six different, or the 12 different partner units that we're a part of in a few minutes. So before we got to our rock star status on campus, and I say that lightly, but uh, I remember when I first interviewed for this position, and we were, uh, Roxana here was walking me across campus, and she literally got like a ton of shout outs from students, just randomly when we were walking across the quad, and I'm like, your students aren't like avoiding eye contact? Because when I used to work, you know, mostly just like in the, the clinical or uh, counseling role, like you know, in the main counseling center during my internship and postdoc, years when I'd see students across campus, they weren't always necessarily comfortable, you know, outing themselves as seeing me um, for mental health services, but these students were. They're like, Roxana, I love you, or like, I need to meet with you. And so it was really amazing how um, this program, and we'll talk a little more about it, uh, was really changing the culture around mental health stigma. And it was, I think you could see the ripple effect of these different communities where students were able to talk more about it very vocally and very visibly, and it helps to break down those barriers for their peers as well. So again, uh, CAN isn't the model that it is now. It didn't start that way. So we did have six from the, the, the uh, first team, and one of our original members, um, actually I think you were the first one that was hired for the position. Um, Dr. Renee Lopez is here, one of our original and incomparable. Oh, and then also, yeah, and so um, initially, can only provided consultations, and I'll get into that in just a little bit, but that's different from um, counseling, at least how we conceptualize counseling. And I think that in the beginning, my understanding is that they were kind of learning the roles as they were going along, trying to figure it out. And it, there were a lot of like growth, uh, growth edges and growing pains with this program. So initially, there were different pairings and different partner units. So the, the colleges were involved. Um, I think that for you, you had two different colleges. Two dean's offices, right? Two dean's offices and the Chilat. Chilat, uh-huh. Yeah. Kind of like the you know, studies. And so I think in the beginning with that pairing, uh, there were things that just weren't working out. Like trying to do outreach with the colleges or the dean's offices didn't look the same way and it didn't quite work the same way. What their needs were versus what what I think uh, in our roles, what we could be successful at, they weren't fitting. So over time, we changed the pairings, and now with the dean's offices, we have uh, counselors that are, they have, that's their specific role, is to work with the dean's offices, which is really great that our director and um, our agency supported that. And so then now, um, like before, like Roxana was with two dean's offices and Chicano Studies, and now you're with Chicano Studies and the EOP program, mm -hmm. correct? Mm -hmm. And so it just fits better with the work that we're doing. So those were some of the changes. Um, also, in the beginning, I think there were uh, some confusion about what our role should be around like student protests. Are we there to act as liaisons? Are we there to mediate? And we found out that it was the roles that I think initially our CAN folks 
were put in um, was not helping us um, build relationships with students. And if anything, it could create more mistrust if they saw that we were extensions of administration. And so it was really about how do we uh, pull back and really think about what's the best way to support students. Um, another change too around that is thinking about, um, let me see here, oh, inconsistent integration of counselors across partner units. So we had all these different partner units that wanted CAN counselors, got CAN counselors, but the way in which they integrated them into their system was really um, inconsistent. And so some folks had spaces that they could count as their own, and it was uh, stable, and they were integrated into staff meetings so that staff could get to know CAN counselors, learn to trust them so they could refer students to them. Um, and others were like roaming because they that there was never like an office space for them to utilize, and, and that makes it hard because you want students to be able to see and recognize that oh that's Roxana's office or that's Rashito's office, and I know that when I stop by there I can count that she's still going to be there versus all of a sudden the, the offices are changing or having a, yeah so it was really hard and so we have a can manager um, that that was let's see when did Paul start in this role two years ago is that right. Three, three. So um, the person that I took the, the place of, so in my role, I'm, only, I'm newer to CAN, uh, like it's about two years now, or two and a half years. Um, the person previously in my position, he's now our CAN manager, and so he understands our work and our role, and we started to institute um, MOU, so memorandums of understanding, so that we know, so that all the partner units know what's expected of them, and they know what we expect of ourselves, like from counseling services, so to make sure that the CAN counselor that's being put into these positions can succeed and be successful. And so I think that's helped establish more consistency, for sure. Um, anything else I'm thinking about? And I think just having a manager helps us protect the unit that we work for. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that CAN feels really protective, like our, when we have a challenge that we're facing, we can go to our manager and say, this is what's, what, what, th this is a challenge, these are some solutions that we have, but now we need some advice. Because we really are negotiating multiple centers, multiple politics, multiple needs, um, so it's nice to have one space to go to help help out with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, oh, go ahead, sorry. Oh, I was just going to talk about the integration of uh, clinical services. Oh, yeah, 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 yes, thank you. Ahead. Oh, yeah, so I forgot about that. <laughs> so um, initially they started out with only consultations, but now we uh, also provide clinical services. So that means, uh, I think that came out of a rise for, uh, a need for services. So. Um, I think this also worked with our legal team, is that right? Where they realized like, okay, so you're giving consultations to students and it was getting into this fuzzy line of like, wait, if you're seeing students for a number of consultations, how is that different from therapy? And how are you protecting the information that is being provided to you as well as managing risk? And so then they instituted clinical services and um, we'll talk a little bit more about how that's, um, we try to sustain that. Any other thoughts around that in terms of clinical services? Okay. <laughs> All right. So, that one. Okay. So here are our CAN counselors, and so there's Roxana again with um, Chicano Chicano Studies Educational Opportunity Program, and our newest CAN counselor that just started today, Dr. Michelle Burt, back yeah. there. Um, and we're super excited. Is paired with um, African American Studies and the Transfer Reentry Re Veteran Center. Um, and then there's me with the Cross-Cultural Center in Asian American Studies. We also have Dr. Sheetal Shaw with um, Services for International Students and Scholars and the Middle East and South Asian Studies Program. Uh, Dr. Coloni Scanlon from Native American Studies and Student Recruitment and Retention Center. And Jesse Zimbardo um, with the Women's Research and Resource Center and LGBTQIA Resource Center. Yeah, go ahead. I really prefer one of those head mics that allow me to dance while I'm talking, but oh, <laughs> this will do fine. Um, so what do we do as CAN counselors? Oh gosh, we do so much. Um, but mainly the difference is we provide individual consultations and individual clinical services. So we can provide, um, did I, is that up there? Individual and group consultations. We'll start with that. Um, so consultations to students. Students can approach us if they just want to chat. Um, they don't have to fill out any paperwork. They don't do an intake. We don't take any notes. Um, well, we have limited notes um, in an anonymous section um, in a shared point, so we track data. Um, but there's no need to take down their student ID number, or get their even their name, so they can be anonymous. Um, and a consultation, um, 
from a student can be anywhere from I'm really concerned about my family member, um, I'm concerned about my roommate, or I think I'm depressed, um, or I'm not sure about my career, or I am having academic difficulty. So that first consultation is really important, and we'll talk a lot more about the differences between the two. Um, but we can provide individual consultations and group consultations, um, and also to staff and faculty. And I think. Um, we do a lot of work with our staff and faculty. Um, just this past year, um, there were quite a few incidents in the media that were pretty triggering for students, but also for staff. And so um, as a support person, I was able to kind of come in and talk to staff and faculty around how best to take care of themselves while trying to support students. Um, so I think, um, and also talking to staff about um, concerns about students. Um, I had a faculty, Chicano Latino professor, talk to me about a student because of something that they wrote in their blue book during a final exam. Um, it was very concerning, and she thought that the student might be at risk of hurting themselves. So they were able to contact me and refer the student to me, and I was able to kind of come in and, and talk with the student in an informal way without getting an intake um, and talk to them about resources available. Uh, we provide limited psychotherapy, and I say limited because we need a lot of time to do our outreach, so we do have a limited caseload of, I think, 10, <laughs> 10 hours supposed to be per week. Um, sometimes we go over and sometimes we go under, um, but we provide psychotherapy if the um, student sometimes builds trust. I think our initial... Um, point is to refer them and be a bridge to uh, ca CAPS services. So um, if at the end of our consultation I recommend counseling, we talk about what counseling is like and the student agrees to go, then that's a, a positive referral. Um, unfortunately, sometimes our marginalized students have had um, negative experiences and counseling services, or maybe one has, and then they all tell each other, and then they <laughs> and then they they share that information. So, unfortunately, sometimes they refuse to go to counseling services. So, we are able to take them on as clients ourselves, and that's been very helpful. We do outreach and training to students, staff, faculty, and staff. Um, in my unit EOP, we have a number of peer advising counselors. I provide all of their diversity training and cultural competency training and their basic counseling skills training uh, to provide personal and social support um, to students. We also provide um, workshops on um, how to work with distressed and distressing students on campus. We provide stress management workshops for students, um, life skills training. Um, I've talk, I've given uh, lectures and workshops on motivation, how to sustain it. Um, I work within the Greek system, and some of our Chicano Latino uh, fraternities and sororities will bring me in to talk about sustaining sisterhood. So I'm able to kind of talk to them about healthy relationships um, with their partners and also with each other. A uh, little bit of conflict resolution and conflict management and also communication skills, love languages. I mean, we get to do lots of fun stuff. Um, the sky's the limit, really, and um, we kind of count on the, the students to guide us to and tell us what they need. Um, they're usually forthright in doing that. Um, did you want to say something? Can I add the retreats? Sure. Oh, sure. Do you want to do it? Yeah. No, go ahead. Um, another <laughs> thing that somehow has come up a lot in the last few years is a lot of our student life centers um, and a lot of our student organizations put on retreats. So leadership retreats, just kind of um, uh, community building retreats, um, and can counselors attend those retreats? And so sometimes we'll work from Friday through Sunday, providing support, doing workshops, um, and doing just consultation or um, basic, sorry, I heard a little child. That got me really excited, by the way. <laughs> um, or, or just like providing support to a student who may have had a reaction to an a, a event at the retreat or a workshop that we did, and that happens a lot. Um, so I'll tell you about a, a time when one of our colleagues, um, Jezzy, mm -hmm. had a student at 2 o'clock in the morning have a panic attack and spent the next three hours sitting with the student, providing them support, um, and getting them okay to be able to handle the weekend, and then getting them referred to services. So we're often doing a lot of community-based work. Mm -hmm. 
And also, I was just going to mention some of the, the flexibility that we have in creating our own programming. Um, for four years now, I've put on a Chicano Chicano issues forum called Mental Menudo. And if you're an artist in this area, you're probably familiar with Gilbert Magulujan, who coined the term Mental Menudo and had issues forums here in the community um, for his social justice art movement. And so before he passed away, I was able to call him and get his permission to use the use the, the, the name. So we have Mental Menudo issues forums at UC Davis, and I invite in a guest speaker who talks about a whole variety of things and be different every month. We just have, to have them once a month. And I pair, them with, pair those Mental Menudos with the student organization who hosts the event. Um, usually the two are related. So if I have um, someone coming in and talking about... Um, I don't know, retention. Um, I pair it with maybe someone from the Student Recruitment and Retention Center, one of those organizations. Um, And we have a menudo or pozole. (laughs) The students love food, but also because it's very nurturing. They don't often get that kind of food um, on campus. So... um, it's, it's been going very well, and it's just an informal psychoeducational space. Um, and then some of us have support groups as well. Um, so we're able to provide therapy groups and, an, in addition, support groups. Okay. Let's see. Anything else about CAN services? Just to, I think, um, emphasize that we don't provide academic counseling mm-hmm. um, so that students get com- don't get confused by that. But we do oftentimes act as advocates for students, too, of helping them get connected with different department units. Because um, we're out in the community more, we do have, I think, uh, more interaction with um, other departments in student affairs so that folks get to know us. We get to know folks in different departments. We're like, okay, so I'm going to send somebody that has a hard time maybe advocating for themselves and I know that this person that I'm sending them to in the you know, College of Arts and Sciences or whatever, um, that this person has a, a really gentle approach with the student. And, and so we can do more of like a gentle handoff. And I think that's been really helpful. But we don't do academic advising. Mm-hmm. Our role is really not a nine to five. <laughs> if you're getting the feel of that, that's true for us. We work lots of evenings and weekends, sometimes till 10, 11 at night. With these retreats, sometimes we're gone for three days at a time. But of course, we get to flex our time, right? Right, boss? Yeah. <laughs> we have wonderful support from our director. Okay, so continuing on with the difference between consultation and therapy, Tatum. Uh, one thing before we do that, I think oh. she was going to share a little bit more about like another role that can has definitely been tapped into providing support around this, especially this past year. Yeah. Um, so we've had a lot of kind of community events um, or events that have happened in our campus community that have impacted the communities that we work with. Um, So Black Lives Matters, for example, there is a lot of um, Islamophobic acts that have happened on our campus, different things that have happened in the world, like the earthquake in Nepal or the shooting in North North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Um, So oftentimes we'll respond to being at, um, request to be at vigils. Um, So Mm -hmm. a CAN counselor has always been at one of those um, vigils just to make sure that students who are impacted um, know that there's support or know that there's services that they can go to um, or will be at protests um, to, again, help help students support. Um, So oftentimes we'll just say, we'll tell the people who are leading the protest or um, I guess people that are leaving the protest, that, you know, the can counselors will be under the tree in this area, and students will just come by if they're impacted. Um, so we'll often spend a lot of our, our days or our evenings um, mm-hmm. at some of these campus community events. And, and, and these requests, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Right, so, go ahead. I was just going to say, and sometimes as impartial observers, we'll say that we're there to provide support, but to kind of observe the space. Sometimes there's dialogues uh, within between groups that have had. Um, ruptures. <laughs> um, and so we, we go there to, to observe the process, maybe restorative justice process um, we just had last year um, on campus, and, and then be able to you know, provide the support for the students and the staff um, later. And, and one thing to just emphasize, too, is that those requests for us to be present at these events is not, only, um, it's not always coming from administration. Oftentimes, it's coming from the students themselves. They'll be like, okay, so we're going to have a, a community town hall or just a, a closed space for students, but we'd really like to have some of the CAN counselors there to provide support in case any students get triggered um, or to provide some self-care um, resources or strategies at the end. And so um, mm-hmm. that's been really nice is that I think the students are seeing and, and, and coming to us as support people too. Mm-hmm. Um, anything else? No? Okay. So going to the difference between therapy and consultation, I think this is really what makes um, the CAN program really unique is that it reduces barriers to get students in and to get them help. And so the consultations were, again, what we started out doing, uh, only doing in the beginning. And we view that as kind of like informal, 
and it's usually uh, something that we see as students using infrequently. So students are actually capped to using only three consultations a year, and it's really about exploring their concerns, identifying their options, developing a plan, and referring them out if necessary. And the information that they share with us is covered under FERPA, okay? And so private information, it's private information and students can be anonymous. So they don't have to disclose their identity to us. There's no paperwork involved. And we um, can put it into our system on PNC just to, we can capture the demographic data by putting uh, them in PNC, but it doesn't put a note in their um, health record. Um, and we're also because, um, Oh, this is actually the decentralized locations. One thing that's nice is that um, students, because we're in the community, so because I have an office on the same floor as Asian American Studies and an office in the Cross-Cultural Center, students can just kind of pop by, and if I'm available, they can uh, you know, meet with me for a consultation or set up a consultation. And so it's a nice first meeting. So most of us have consultations for our first meeting with students to kind of give them a glimpse, a glimpse of like what is counseling like and get them, uh, give them an opportunity to get to know us because it's a lot for them to come in and share a lot of themselves. And we know, especially with underrepresented uh, communities, especially communities of color, um, kinship or like relationships are so important. So how do I know that this person is trustworthy? Um, and so I think that's been a real uh, great feature of our work in the community. So with therapy, when we explain this with our students, oh yes, did you have a question? Do you want me to answer that? Should yes. we do it? Okay. So um, that was part of the legal considerations that we'll probably um, talk about later, but um, just a quick response, maybe? We can talk about it now. Oh, right okay, now. sure. Mm -hmm. um, so that was something that was coming up, and that was the situation once for me, not often, but once. Um, and so what we were doing, or what we, what we do now, is in our consultation role, we have a statement that we say this is not uh, formal psychotherapy. Today we're having a consultation, and that's going to be like this. And at the end of the consultation, um, you know, we'll decide together, you know, what, what would be the best thing to do. I'll present to you your options. Um, and then as they talk, if something comes up that's concerning, um, I'll stop them right there and let them remind them that we're mandated reporters. Um, but because we haven't taken any intake, we have no more, we might not even have their name to report anything. Um, and actually one time I did make a CPS report based on the information that I had and I had just a name. So I fulfilled my obligation to make the report, um, gave the student resources, um, and then did my best to help the student decide what to do next. Did that answer your question? Kind of. Kind of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. I mean, so I think the it's thoughts of suicide is a little bit different. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I, yeah, to? but I think it's, it's a fine line that we have to walk all the time. And it's something very similar to what, like, uh, when we talk about our role in terms of mandated reporting and the consultation role, it's very similar to other student affairs or, like, uh, any UC employee, right? Mm -hmm. Any UC, even it's the peer counselors are mandated, mandated reporters. Mandated reporter. mm -hmm. And so I think that's. That, that it's treated under, kind of like in that same vein, it's like mm -hmm. how we, we approach it. But I think that, um, hopefully, I think all of us, I, I believe we all have the skills of just like how do we nuance that when we explain that to the students, mm -hmm. of just like stopping them before they get to that point and being like, hey, you know, I just want to remind you so that here are your rights around this, but we try to coach it in a way of like, I'm not trying to rat you out or like get you in trouble or, you know, force you to do anything you don't want, but this is coming from a place of caring. Mm -hmm. um, and it's done in a way to empower them to mm -hmm. have the decision to continue that conversation or not disclose names if they want. Um, but really what works is, like this, in five years this has come up once for me, um, but and, and then on the issue around risk, um, we have the time to build you know, that relationship and the trust so the student comes back and we're able to help them and roll them into clinical services. Um, but we, yeah, we were constantly doing some risk assessments initially. Yeah. 
we documented things differently back then. <laughs> um, but even now we have a document that we um, keep on every consultation that we give. Um, it doesn't give a name. It's an anonymous. Um, it's not linked to their chart in PNC. Um, it is in the scheduling side. And um, we do state that we clarified our role. Um, we described... Um, consultation versus therapy, and then we have a whole risk assessment um, that we did if it pertains to the student homicidal risk and so on. Yeah. Tush. You have more time to have those conversations and more resources. And yeah. there's been lots of conversations that involved our legal team, um, our legal counsel yeah. um, around the consultations and mm -hmm. specifically what we're saying to our students when we begin a consultation to make sure that I guess the, the university and we ourselves are covered. Um, so that, that was something that we worked very closely with in terms of making sure that we have something in place around that. Mm -hmm. um, but you're, I mean, I think as when we think about like traditional counseling, this is a real dicey line that we're walking. It feels really uncomfortable. I know when I first started mm -hmm. a position, I was like, really? That's what we do? That's, <laughs> that's like going against everything I was, I was taught, but then mm -hmm. it really works with building relationships in the community and getting students in. It really does. It's what, it's what the students are looking for yeah. and it's what the students utilize. And it's, it's how they love yeah. to access care. It feels really safe to them. Yeah. I would add to that, I mean, I think because the students feel safe, they also feel like they have more agency to make a decision. Um, so oftentimes I'll have a student come in for consultation, and as they're telling me kind of things that are going on with them, I'll just say, this, is, this might be a good time to transition us into a clinical relationship. Mm -hmm. um, now, and, and this is on our first session of consultation. They were telling me a little bit. I got to know them. They got to know me. Now they can make that decision, and I'll tell them the reasons why. You know, I'll tell them, you know, you're telling me about this, and I want to ask more questions, but I feel a little uncomfortable. I want to I wanna push you a little bit here, but I want to make sure that you, we're in a kind of a safe therapeutic relationship to be able to do that. Or I know that you're, you're about to tell me something that feels really important, and I want to make sure that you're protected. So that all the information you tell me is confidential. I want you to have that agency to make that decision. Um, and oftentimes, because they've already started off with an informal kind of trusting relationship with me, even in that first session, even if it's 20 minutes after meeting me, they kind of feel like, OK, you're right. I'm going to make that decision to come into counseling. And we'll, we'll change that relationship right then and there. We'll do the whole um, informed consent. I'll give them the information, et cetera. Um, and then we'll kind of make it into an IC or in, intake. Mm -hmm. yeah. We all have iPads <laughs> to make that process smoother. <laughs> yeah, so that's, uh, that's one thing that's really nice, too, is that we can seamlessly transition into counseling with the students and know that, you know, if they start sharing more of these uh, significant concerns and we feel that, wow, you know, like one or two infrequent check-ins is not really going to help you here. Here's what I recommend, that we can just fold them into our caseloads and see them as well. Um, and so then that's when we would then operate under more like the traditional structured therapy mm -hmm. model. Um, and I don't, I've never had a problem with getting a student going from consultation to uh, counseling. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I'd say that's probably very similar to most of my mm -hmm. colleagues. But it may take one or two consultations, and those are for students that aren't um, as high risk. Um, but uh, those, that I was able to fold them in pretty well. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts around that? No? And we'll talk more about the legal, ethical considerations in yeah. a few slides. But we did just share a lot of information with all of you. Do you have any other questions? You're welcome to ask them as they come up. Yeah. yeah. Just, just to be clear what you're saying, mm -hmm. you, said it's, you haven't had too much of a challenge when in a consult you realize that you're counseling. 
yeah. direction, mm -hmm. folding them into your schedule? Yes. Both happen, definitely. I think, and it depends on our units and the, the, the populations that we serve. In the educational opportunity program, most of my students don't have a problem disclosing their name. They don't have issues with that, so they're, they're likely to do that, and they're likely to trust me in my referral um, to counseling services. So it has been a bridge many times. And other populations, like the LGBTQ um, population, I think that's less likely. Um, sometimes, so it's all different for all of our CAN counselors. Um, but the wonderful thing is that we have options for them. No, we don't do any of our time inside of the counseling center. Although one of our um, resource centers, the Women in Research and Research wait Resources and Research Center, is in the same building as our counseling center, and uh, and so they're they're not, but they're not on like the the same floors necessarily. Um, we are very much. I mean, we are um, part of the counseling services, and that is actually who pays our like our our paychecks too. So that's something that was negotiated in terms of who supervises us and who do we. Um, ultimately report to its counseling services. Right. We attend um, weekly consultation meetings, um, so staff consultation kind of groups, mm -hmm. um, clinical consultation. We go to all our staff meetings. We go to all the staff events at the counseling center. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And a couple of us are uh, emphasis area supervisors oh, yeah. for the training program for the pre- and post-doctoral interns. Mm -hmm. And internship super or uh, individual supervisors as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then you know, Emphasis on the learning together. I think a lot of our counseling staff reach out to us to consult about students that they're working with and vice versa. We have wonderful, fantastically trained staff uh, with lots of specialties that, that we reach out to them as well. So we all work as a team. There's a question in the back. So it first came out of the, is it the Cal Mesa, is that the same funds or no, it's it, the tier two funds. Tier two. So uh, that came out of the 2006 uh, UCOP report. And so our um, 
university, uh, they decided to create this program. So that's where the initial money came from. And then, but our funding stream comes through Student Health and Counseling Services. <laughs> we, we think everybody should have this program because I think it works. It's really, working really, really well. well. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Did you have a question too? And in case anyone's wondering, that's our director, Sarah Hahn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, I'll stop. Answering. No, no, no. It's been no, really thank you, Sarah. Really Thanks for being here. Absolutely. We want that funding stream to continue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so in the interest of time, I'm wondering, um, should we go over the strengths and challenges yes. or skip to legal considerations? Why don't we skip to legal considerations? Okay. We'll come back. Since that Just, was That seems more up. important right now. Okay. Oops. There, you go. there sorry. <laughs> Um, so we kind of talked a little bit about the differences between consultation and therapy, confidentiality, so that's something that we have to really emphasize with students, and also um, negotiate with our colleagues, so colleagues uh, in different like you know, student affairs offices, and I'm sure many of you experience the same thing when folks are calling you about a student, but then even just within, um, with each other. So it might be that um, I have seen a student for a consultation and then uh, maybe the student later has uh, decided to access care through our main counseling center and has met with another uh, counselor and they already like went through the intake process and are working with them in counseling but then uh, when they meet with that counselor they disclose that oh yeah I met with Tatum well that counselor because they're under HIPAA now that the student has uh, entered into a counseling relationship um, has to get a release of information from the student in order to talk to me about my work with that student However, because I'm covered under FERPA because it was a consultation, I technically could disclose um, how I worked with that individual. I also, if I didn't, um, I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah? And then if, say, um, if I worked with a student or saw them for a consultation, I um, do not have permission to go into their uh, medical record, even though I technically have access because of PNC and all that stuff. But that's something that, you know, um, our quality assurance committee, is that what? Yeah, they, they can monitor like who accesses whose records for what reason. Um, so that, that, those are some of the things that we have to be very careful about, like how we disclose information with each other, with other offices. Yeah. yeah. And oftentimes students are referred to us by um, individuals or staff on campus. And so let's say a faculty member in, refers a student to me. Um, we meet for consultation. The faculty member contacts me and says, hey, did student A come to see you? Technically, I can say yes, because under FERPA, I can still disclose that, yes, student A did come to see me. But what I do, because I, I think I still keep my clinician hat on most mm -hmm. of the time, is I tell the student, hey, faculty member referred you. You might want to let them know that you just stopped by and we were able to speak. So I encourage the student to kind of relay the information. So mm -hmm. I don't have to, in my mind, I don't have to break like privacy or kind of like uh, straddle that line. I let the student mm -hmm. relay that information back to them. Mm -hmm. But technically, I'm allowed to. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Any questions? Uh, yes. Um, one of the themes over the last couple of days that I've heard uh, and experienced myself too is, you know, too much to do. <laughs> uh, so I'm wondering how this kind of sub-program with six staff of its own, which is part of the Legal Counseling Center, which has, I'm sure, its own influx and stuff, mm -hmm. how does the too much to do feel for you guys? <laughs> As we talk about sustainability, right? Yeah, that's <laughs> a very good question. Yes, stress management, <laughs> work-life balance is very important. We're reminding each other about that all the time. Um, but we have the flexibility. So I think what's, hap what's helped for me is understanding and realizing that the year is going to be, I'm going to be very visible and do lots of outreach initially. Um, as students meet me and hear from me in their classrooms, they're going to come to me for individual sessions. I have the flexibility of, of 
of having more counseling sessions and less outreach hours. So within my 40 per week, I can kind of vary it up to meet the needs of the students. Um, but it, it does take some boundary setting to kind of tell a student um, I'm available next week. And technically what I do is I have drop-in hours um, once a week for students who are having a crisis. Um, and they're, they know that once they come to me for drop-in hours, I meet with them that one time. And then after that, we schedule appointments. So I always have some time to meet with students and accommodate them um, I think one thing too, just kind of like managing any clinical caseload is that thinking about, okay, who at what point needs to be referred out for services too. And so I really try to bridge that gap. And then because they have built a relationship with me and hopefully at this point trust me, um, I can, you know, help, you know, hand them off to a community provider or um, get them integrated, uh, get them into one of our um, awesome therapy groups or support groups on campus as well so that they have. Uh, additional services available to yeah. and I think a couple of things to keep in mind too is that I'm not only working with my two communities um, mm -hmm. and so if you know if something's happening with the Asian American community on campus and Tatum needs some support we are there mm -hmm. like the, and the students know that students know that CAN counselors are available to all of them even though we're partnered with different units so I think that's really helpful I think the other thing that's really helpful with sustainability is that we're really integrated into the centers that we work with so not only are we part of student health and counseling services we're where I'm a part of SISS which is services for international students and scholars and I'm a part of Middle Eastern South Asia studies program so I have relationships with the staff and the faculty we go to lunches we talk we support each other when things are happening in the program or in our community um, so that really helps with our sustainability um, mm -hmm. those are the people I go to happy hour with um, and that's really important <laughs> Um, and I think the last thing is the flexibility um, in terms of like if I work a weekend I try to take some time off during the week so I can kind of recuperate um, but we're trying to put some boundaries around that which is going to be really helpful this year um, so I, I talked about going to retreats we went to a lot of retreats I think between the I think there was a little over 20 retreats that mm -hmm. the six of us had gone to last year um, and so this year just we decided we're going to go to two each that's that's a pretty good amount that's 12 retreats and if there's another retreat that comes up that really calls to us that the community may really need us we're gonna go for a little while which means a four-hour little trip here and there um, which is still work but it's not the entire weekend so we're gonna try to put some boundaries around some of the work that we do which is which I think will be helpful moving forward um, but like anybody we definitely experience burnout um, we think there's been different times where we've just had to take some time off to recuperate or engage in self-care in ways um, that we know that we needed it and so that burnout is definitely there mm -hmm. and we um, we do take on a lot of work mm -hmm. but it's nice to have a little bit of, uh, of an ebb and flow mm -hmm. with the work and the, the stress it's very rewarding work though balances out the students really um, engage and love having us <laughs> so that's helpful um, okay a question back there. Sorry. oh sorry Initially, oh, no, go ahead, please. <laughs> Initially, there's a program called Let's Talk um, out of Cornell. Um, so that was a program that was used to model CAN off of, but we have evolved into a really completely different program. Um, so I spoke to some of the people at, who run Let's Talk in Cornell last year um, to talk about just evaluations and kind of how they're, they're thinking about um, future directions for their program, um, and we realized our programs are really different. Um, so I actually don't think there's a program like this um, in California. out there. Mm -mm. Yeah, yet until your campus is adopted. Mm -hmm. <laughs> do you go back to the strengths? Do you think maybe strengths and challenges? Um, we're or kind we're of out of time, so okay. I wanted to just maybe give a perspective yeah. from campus units. Okay, so one of our uh, units uh, gave us this feedback. Uh, the community counselor is a valued and involved member of our team. She connects with career and student staff and demonstrates genuine concern and investment in our individual and collective well-being. She offers insights that help us serve students effectively and also thrive holistically in our own work. That was coming from one of the unit supervisors. Here's another one. The staff's approachability as a CAN counselor and the content of information she has shared during outreach events has set the tone in our community that facing mental health concerns is nothing to be ashamed about and that mental health care can be something that is affirming and helpful for our members of our community. Her expertise and calm are essential assets to our team's functioning and enable us to, in turn, better serve our communities. Oops. Yeah. There we go. So we would love to see this program um, happen across different campuses. Um, 
And I think that the program is going to continue evolving. And so we, we do think that it's a model that has worked really well at the UC Davis campus. It, it serves our underrepresented and underserved communities really well. Um, we hope to see it grow. I think there's lots of different units on campus requesting their own CAM counselors. Um, and so hopefully the people who are funding the program, who may be in here, um, <laughs> um, also support that, support the growth. Um, but the partner units also, the, the ones that don't have CAN counselors also know that they can turn to us and they can turn to CAPS as a result of that or counseling services. Um, we have, we're introducing training opportunities for interns and so Roxana is this year is supervising two interns um, working with undocumented and AB 540 students. Um, I'm supervising um, inter an intern for individual supervision who's also really interested in multicultural issues. Um, so we're hoping that there's, there are going to be more training opportunities that our interns and um, postdocs can take advantage of. Oh, and she's also supervising a postdoc, correct? Uh, Shito? Or, uh, who did? Jesse. Jesse was oh, okay. supervising the emphasis area of working with LGBTQI okay. folks. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Anything else you would want to add? More can. <laughs> more can counselors would be great. <laughs> but... <laughs>